Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Mike Anderson. My guest this week is Wildlife Division Chief Jeb Williams. Today we're going to talk about the big three, the moose, elk, and bighorn sheep. Jeb, that application deadline is coming soon. When is it? March 25th. And uh, so, yeah, get your application in and you have a little bit of time. Of course, all online, easy, simple process, and um, put your name in the hat for a really good, great experience in North Dakota. Okay, let's talk about each of the species separate. Let's talk about elk. Uh, how many licenses this year? So we have an increase of elk licenses this year. We have 523 elk licenses. Last year we had 479, so uh, an increase of 45, I believe. And so that's a, that's a nice increase. All of those, all the increases coming from the western, western part of the state, and we've talked about that over the, over the last several years as far as the elk population, what it's doing in the western part of North Dakota. And we have an elk study research project going on out there that's really helping us and guiding us and giving us some really good information out there as far as elk numbers and future elk surveys and how, how for us to better monitor the population and just giving us some wonderful information. Okay, and that'll help obviously manage the elk herd down the road. It, and it already has. I mean, just in the, in the couple short years that we've had, so there's 90 elk that are collared out there total. And our big game staff just put some additional collars on this year from the ones that the elk that were harvested out there, trying to keep that, that collar number at 90 every year. And so they got that back up to speed here about a month ago. So all 90 elk collared again. And just in a few short years, it's given us some really remarkable information, not only for elk management, but the, but the always somewhat controversial challenge the department has as far as landowner licenses and landowner allocation licenses and uh, who to approve within the uh, preferential landowner license area. And this is this has given us some really good information to show where the elk are are spending a lot of their time and which landowners are being impacted the most. And so it's, it's providing us some good information in a lot of ways. Okay, let's move on to the E6 unit, the Standing Rock Elk uh, unit. Uh, that's been going on for a few years now. How's that going? It's going, it's going well. We, we actually just got done meeting with, uh, with our, our landowner group down there here just about three weeks ago. And um, that's always very good and uh, very informational for the department and I, and I hope for, for them as well when we're able to share information with what we know. And, and, and that's, a, that's an area down there that we knew going into it is, is going to be a little challenging, has some challenges associated with it. Number one, there, there's not any public land in that area. And so when we give out once in a lifetime license, that's, that's different from all of our other elk units is that, you know, there are individuals that don't have a guaranteed place to hunt. And so landowners have been very critical and been very good as far as access goes in that area, uh, as far as people being able to have the opportunity to, to hunt elk. And then in addition, we have a relationship, partnership with uh, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, uh, which has allowed state licensed lottery hunters the opportunity to hunt on on tribal land with permission as well and so that's what our MOU that has been in place has allowed for and it's allowed for some collaboration on the elk numbers down there and elk licenses and just managing that area somewhat together just simply simply because elk don't recognize the the different boundaries that are in place whether that's a state boundary whether it's a tribal boundary those types of things and so Trying to, uh, trying to coordinate those efforts is always a good thing. And so the partnership is good. It's a great thing. Okay. Uh, any other changes besides more elk licenses this year? One of, one of the things that is in our chronic wasting disease proclamation that people will, will see with the elk application process. And so anytime any, anybody is applying for elk, moose, or even deer, if they're applying in a unit where chronic wasting disease restrictions are in place, that's going to pop up and notify them on the application process. So this year, elk unit E2 is being added to our carcass restriction area, carcass importation, um, exportation of that, of that area. And so people need to be mindful of that. And they'll be reminded about that if they're applying for E2. And if they're not comfortable with those restrictions, and then they might want to consider applying somewhere else. Right, and the other unit is E6, so E2 and E6 have restrictions. Correct, thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, let's move on to moose. 
Yeah, so moose have been, uh, you know, we've been going up and up and up with moose these last number of years. You know, three consecutive years we set a, a record number, issued a record number of licenses. Um, this year we backed off just a little bit, although uh, we didn't back off necessarily in the areas where the moose have been the most populated the last number of years. In, in unit M6, we decrease the licenses by five. Just it's, it's an area where we don't have a lot of moose anymore, and we did see the uh, success rate really dip last year, and so we just, we just made a minor cut back there. But we, uh, we kept the pressure on in the, in the other areas as far as moose numbers, especially that M10, M11 area where you know, we've really been hearing about a lot of moose numbers, knowing there's a lot of moose in that area. Um, one of the things that was challenging last fall in that area and, and challenging a lot of parts of the state was the, the wet fall that we had along with the standing crop. And so that did, that did have an impact on the harvest success. Normally we have over 90% success rate for moose. This year we dipped, we were below 90%. And so we did see a dip in the, in the harvest success, but um, we decided to stay just about the same for moose licenses just due to the high numbers of moose in that northwest part of the state. So how many how many moose licenses are available this so year? So a total number of 474 moose licenses uh, will be allocated for this year. Okay, any chronic wasting units for moose? Yes, yeah, so last year unit M10 was included in the chronic wasting disease restriction area and then this year unit M11 will be added to that as well. Okay, and every year Jeb we give tips on how you can be more successful with moose and elk licenses explain yeah and anybody that knows me or has had this conversation with me knows that I do like to promote the 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 cow portion the antlerless portion of our moose and elk and because we do get, of course get a lot of discussions and some complaints from people about not being able to draw the elk or the moose license and, and of course everybody naturally wants to draw an antlered and you know, wants to draw the bull portion of that license well that's just it's not possible and it's it's not going to happen as far as the number of applicants we're dealing with right around 20,000 applicants for moose right around 18,000 for elk and as we just talked about just a couple hundred actual licenses and so one way that people can really increase their odds if they want to hunt moose or elk in North Dakota is apply for an antlerless tag and your odds significantly increase going from under a 1% chance of drawing to close to some units 50 60 percent chance of actually drawing and so your odds go up significantly okay let's move on to bighorn sheep explain explain that whole process with the bighorn sheep so going back uh, probably close to a handful of years now as we changed the process to where bighorn sheep people still applied at the normal time as they do for elk and moose However, they really don't know how many licenses they're applying for yet and where those licenses are going to be allocated. We, we've chosen to, to wait and to get more accurate survey information closer to the season, which has been a benefit for both the department and, of course, then the recipients, the hunters, because we've been able to allocate a few more tags just based on maybe not being quite as conservative. And so we wanted to make sure during that initial time that the disease issues were we're, we're not running crazy and rampant and that type of thing. Um, but we've also, as, as time has moved on, just realized this is, this is probably the right thing to do regardless of that. And so people still need to apply at this point in time. And then we will determine, which we have again for the last four or five years, the end of August, we determine the number of licenses, where they're at, and then call the individual uh, recipients of those licenses once that lottery has actually been held. Another positive thing with sheep, Jeb, happened in early February, I guess, or late, maybe it was late January, but explain that. A real positive thing, yeah. So any, any time we can bring new bighorn sheep into North Dakota is a, is a really great thing, and, and an and a additional partnership with, a, with the uh, three affiliated tribes in the northwest part of the state uh, brought that relationship together and then brought, essentially, it was the reason for that happening, the sheep in Montana that came from Rocky Boy Indian Reservation and partnered with ourselves and partnered with QU, uh, the outdoor gear company, and then of course three affiliated tribes um, to bring in sheep into, into that part of the state where there is good sheep habitat, 
where our department is going to assist three affiliated tribes in the management of those sheep for a certain number of years until they get up to speed and comfortable with that management. And then we have an agreement in place where we're going to alternate those licenses if and when that opportunity comes where the sheep do well enough to where there is mature rams in that population. So just a, just a great working relationship and a great project altogether that brought additional sheep to the state. Okay, but let's talk about the bighorn sheep population in the southern Badlands. Yeah, so last, last spring we, we had a great discussion, I thought, with the public at the advisory board meetings about the possibility of removing the approximately 20 remaining bighorn sheep in the southern Badlands that have just been, they've just been kind of there for the last number of years. Haven't been doing a lot as far as, you know, reproducing and, and, um, and repopulating that area. have just, just been really kind of struggling, really. And so our thought process is, is to remove those sheep and then bring in a new healthy bunch of sheep from the, which we did uh, for, for the three affiliated tribes. The same affiliation of sheep out in the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation area, that same connection, and bring those into the southern Badlands. But, you know, we, we first have to be responsible and knowing that if we bring in healthy sheep in that area that there are no disease concerns and risks in that area and, and one of the one of the concerns and risks is of course the the intermingling with domestic sheep and with bighorn sheep wild sheep that go into those domestic sheep populations and then bring back certain viruses bacteria into the population of the wild sheep and so we have to make sure that the proximity of the release site is is a safe distance to any domestic sheep and so we're taking our time with that making sure that we're being responsible before we bring in healthy sheep into that area a lot of great information jim thank you thank you mike like jeb just mentioned the application deadline for the moose elk and bighorn sheep lotteries is wednesday march 25th to apply visit the game and fish department's website at gf nd.gov. For Wildlife Division Chief Jeb Williams and the rest of the staff here at the Game and Fish Department, thanks for joining us for this week's Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.